Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, worship band. They're amazing. Uh, really, really grateful for them. It's been fun to uh, get to preach the word after them. I wish we could go longer, but, you know, maybe another time. Um, so uh, I hope you've had a great day today. Uh, and I got to speak in several classes, so that was fun. Um, we've had a great time here these last uh, 48 hours. Uh, so tonight, um, we're going to continue kind of this discussion of what it looks like to, um, to be sent um, by the Lord and to be his faithful servant. Uh, the first uh, talk yesterday was about risk. Um, and then yesterday, last night, I asked you to ponder four questions uh, that I believe could really change your life and ultimately uh, certainly your zip code, whether that's uh, in the continental U.S., or, you know, across an ocean somewhere someday that God would take you and use you. Um, and really, uh, this whole week is about God's invitation for you. He wants, you know, we know this. He's moving. He's at work all over the planet. He's at work uh, across oceans. He's at work right here in this room. We believe that. He's at work on this campus. And he's inviting you and he's inviting me to join him where he's at work. Right, And so as you've kind of, I hope you processed those four questions last night. Um, and as you, as you think through them, you know, uh, where could God take you? How could God use you um, as he invites you into the story that he is writing? Um, I believe the next chapter in the story that God is uh, writing is going to be really, really exciting. Um, and he wants, uh, you know, it, it, as you turn the page, as he kind of turns the page, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're in the next paragraph. And um, one thing I'm convinced of is that God's going to raise up a generation of Christ followers who are willing to lay everything on the line. Um, and maybe that's you in this room. So that's what we're praying for. Um, and isn't it exciting to know that uh, he wants to use you? And he has a plan for you. Um, so let's, um, we're going to open up God's word. We're going to look at uh, two or three passages of scripture tonight. Well, maybe six. I don't know. We'll see how far we get. Um, but um, all of, all, all this whole idea tonight is, is now really moving into you living your life on mission, right? Living your life on mission. The first two talks were kind of probing your heart, I hope, and asking you to ponder some things. But now what we're going to look at tonight and then tomorrow is going to be you fleshing it out, living your life on mission. And so one of the phrases uh, we use a lot in our ministry uh, with Greater Europe Mission, with UKUSA Ministries, is this phrase, the gospel moves at the speed of relationships, right? I want you to remember that phrase. I want you to write it down in your heart, okay? I want you to write it on your notes in your phone or whatever. That phrase is the gospel moves at the speed of relationships. And I think the Apostle Paul established uh, some really powerful, deep relationships in his apostleship, in his missionary journeys, the first, second, and third missionary journey. And we know that because when he writes back to them, um, there's just this really deep, rich language of love and relationships. I want to read a couple of verses over us before uh, we jump into 2 Timothy chapter 2. The first verse is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. Doesn't that just leak relationships. I mean, there's so, there's some really deep language in there. We loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you, not only the gospel, not only the message of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him, but we want to share our very lives with you as well. That is the, uh, the ethos or the, the essence of discipleship. Philippians chapter one, verse three through six, I thank my God every time I remember you. Listen, I'm an emotional dude, and I get weepy over all kinds of things. But, man, I think Paul was emotional, right? The first verse, we loved you so much. The second passage in Philippians, I thank two totally different places. I thank my God every time I remember you. 
in my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, it's so personal, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The gospel moves at the speed of relationships. The gospel advances in relationships. The gospel blossoms in relationships. And the gospel produces fruit that remains in relationships. Man, hold on to those three thoughts. The gospel advances in relationships. It blossoms in relationships. And it produces fruit that remains in relationships. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're here to produce fruit that produces fruit. Everything that's healthy in our whole world is producing something fruitful. Like, I don't know about you, but if uh, I'm like the world's worst uh, green thumb, okay? I have no green thumb. I, I pretty much kill any tree or plant or anything I try to do. So what does that mean? That means I am not good at that, okay? That's what that means. But no, it means whatever I'm doing to that is not allowing it to be healthy, right? Things that are healthy produce fruit. Things that are healthy produce fruit that remain. And so as we kind of process this gospel moves at the speed of relationships, I've often wondered why and how does God seem to pick and choose certain people to use them so powerfully, right? Why is that? Why does he do that? And um, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to recognize that as Christ followers, there are some things that you and I have to possess in order to be used by God, right? So how do you and I live our life on mission? Um, I will say this. I was born in 1962, okay, and I have no idea when I will draw my last breath, okay? I was out running this morning, and I crossed the street early, early, early. It was still dark, and I didn't see this car coming, right? And he had his lights on, but I just, I didn't see him, and I thought, well, this could be the day right here. I'm crossing whatever that was, rabbit, what is that called? Swamp rat, yes, yeah, I almost said swamp rat, swamp rabbit trail, that's it, right there, over there, and, and I'm like, okay, this could be the last day, right? You don't have any idea when your last breath will be drawn, and so it's really, it's, it's, it's pertinent, it's, it's so important that you and I recognize that it's all about the dash, it's all about what the, the day you were, from the day you were born until the day you draw your last you are being fruitful. You are being productive for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. Listen, nothing else matters. Nothing. What this world has to offer you and me will never satisfy. Nothing else matters. Now, don't, don't hear me say your family doesn't matter. Don't hear me say your relationship. It's all about relationships. But I'm just telling you, from, from, the, from this moment till you draw your last, it's all about the dash between now and the time you draw your last breath. What are you doing to produce fruit that remains? Are you going to live your life on mission? Well, how do you and I assure that at the end of our lives, we'll look back. Uh, Piper wrote, wrote a great book and preached a great sermon way back in the field in Memphis, Don't Waste Your Life. How can you and I look back at the end of our lives and have an assurance that we've not wasted our life? I'm going to give you three or four principles that I think will allow you to walk and live and do life on mission until your last breath. And the first one is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 through, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who has enlisted him. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for... This time, just another chance to worship you, another chance to, as Paul said in Acts, to in him, in him live and move and have our being. We're grateful for this chance. And Lord, we're grateful for the breath in our lungs and the, the blood pumping through our veins tonight. And God, we want our lives to count. 
We want this dash, this thing called life on planet earth to matter for your kingdom. And so spirit of the living God, take your word, quicken it deep down into our hearts and do spiritual things in us tonight so that we won't waste another day. We won't waste our life. We'll look back knowing that we've poured it all out for the glory of God. And so spirit of the living God, again we ask that you would fall fresh on this place, that you would stir our hearts for people to recognize the people that you're bringing into our life day by day, moment by moment, place by place, wherever you take us, wherever our foot falls, people matter. And so God, help us to recognize that tonight, that the gospel moves at the speed of relationships. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first thing I think you need to possess in order to live your life on mission is the heart of a soldier, all right? Possess the heart of a soldier. Now, a year ago, I've only confessed this publicly to Aaron, okay? And so a year ago, I was at North Greenville University, COVID had, you know, it was our first campus, and COVID had been, you know, kicking around for a little while. Aaron, I'm outing myself here, okay? So if it, you know, forgive me, all right? So I, um, I had a bit of an attitude towards COVID, okay? I'm not going to lie. I think, never mind, I'm not even going to go there right now. It's uber political. But anyway, I, I, um, I think I got COVID here last September, okay? And so I got on a plane and I flew from here to Colorado to a, our executive staff meeting. So our president was in the room, the CFO was in the room, myself and two other guys. And um, <laughs> I got a call on Saturday. So I left here on Wednesday, flew to Colorado. We had two days of meetings. And I got a call from my president on Saturday and he said, I am so sick, I've gone to the doctor and I have COVID and I was like, oh shoot, because <laughs> I wasn't feeling great on Thursday, like two days before that. But it wasn't terrible, right? So I didn't like, I wasn't like awful. I was just not feeling good. I thought I had a sinus infection. So he calls me and he says, uh, this was Saturday afternoon. I think I have, uh, no, I have COVID. I've tested positive for COVID and I'm like, Oh, wow. Okay, so um, I had called my doctor when I got back from Colorado, and I said, Doc, these are my symptoms. Um, he's a good enough friend that I can call him on the weekend, right? So I called him, Doc, these are my symptoms. What do you think? He said, oh, I think you have a sinus infection. That's what I thought. So then, like, the next day, the president calls and says, I've got COVID. And I'm like, dang, I think I gave my president COVID, right? So anyway, so I went immediately and got tested, and sure enough, I had it, okay? Now, Clearly, I was on the backside of it because I had it before everybody else, but the CFO was awfully sick. His family got sick. His wife got it. My, my president, his wife got it. So it was awful. But all that to say, that's a really long story, just to say that while I was quarantining, which um, I'm not very good at that either, I was quarantining, I watched the uh, series, The Band of Brothers, okay? Now, I'm not going to recommend that to you because it's rated R and it's brutal and there's some really bad language. But anyway, I've never seen it from beginning to end. Okay. And so I'm, I'm old enough. I could watch this in all, all its brutality. And, um, I was overwhelmed by this heart of a soldier right now. If you've seen it, there's a guy named Winters and he's like a commander's, I mean, he's like a, a soldier's commander. I mean, he is, he is the epitome of the greatest like commander these guys could have. And so much so that any time they went into a fray, he said, you, he said, you guys go do this. No, he didn't. You know what he said? He said, follow me. Right? That's what he said, follow me. And so the, the heart of a soldier is to, to follow his commanding officer. And so it was over and over and over again through all of these scenes, through all of these uh, you know, what, what do you call them? I've lost my mind. Uh, each one, there's like 12 or 13 of them. Um, what am I doing? Episodes, that's it, right? Golly, I, I can't even get this out. Anyway, so in each episode, he's saying, follow me. My favorite scene is they were, they were in this field and they were, all, I mean, they were going to totally be wiped out. And so they do a, a bayonet charge, right? And what does he do? He says, when the smoke pops, 
come after me. And he, of course, he gets out of the, the uh, thing and he starts running. And the trench, and he's already halfway down the field before the smoke pops. And then the rest of the guys come, right? What is he saying? He's saying, follow me. Now, what's amazing about all that is, that's exactly what Jesus said. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Now, when you think about the heart of a soldier, right? When you think about what that generation did for freedom, when you think about all that they did, you know what, you know what they didn't ever even think Oh, I'm not doing that. You know what they did? They had already determined that their yes was on the table. They'd already thrown it down. No matter what, I'm facing certain death. I'm facing certain peril. No matter what, my yes is on the table. And then that's the posture of a soldier. The heart of a soldier says to Jesus, and man, if I could pray anything over you today, and I've been praying for you a lot, is that out of this week, you would come to the conclusion that it's worth the risk and my yes, God, is on the table. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. My yes is on the table. So the heart of a soldier has already determined, no matter what the question is, no matter what the challenge is, no matter what is before them, that their yes is on the table. Is your yes on the table tonight to King Jesus? He's... He's saying the same thing. Follow me. Will you get up out of the trench and follow your master, follow your savior, follow King Jesus? Is your yes on the table? Do you possess the heart of a soldier? The second characteristic of someone who's living their life on mission, you've got the heart of a soldier, you've already said yes, you're not getting entangled in civilian affairs, the things of the world, you're like fixed, your eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Hebrews chapter 12, you are locked in, your yes is on the table, I'm following Jesus. The second thing that a person needs to possess to live on mission is the heart of a shepherd, right? So what is... What does the heart of a shepherd look like? Well, a shepherd um, looks after a flock, right? A shepherd has responsibilities to nurture and care and, and look after and protect all of the things that he, uh, the sheep that he's shep, uh, shepherding, that he's looking after. Um, and so there are three or four qualities that I want to highlight for you. All right. So we've lived, we lived in England for nine years and the best time in England is spring because that's lambing season, right? There's nothing cuter than a little baby lamb. All right. Now they stink like all get out, but they're so cute. Okay. And they're everywhere. Now the shepherds in England are no longer, well, there's a few that you would say are similar to past shepherds, but most of them are on four wheelers or mules now. So it's a little bit different, not mules like a donkey mule, like the vehicle, all right? That's how they shepherd. Um, but, but so here, here are some qualities of a shepherd. As you kind of think about, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to have the heart of a soldier. I'm, my yes is on the table. And then God, as I'm living on mission, I'm seeing the field around me differently now because I'm living on mission. I'm seeing people through the eyes of a shepherd, right? And so here they are. First of all, a shepherd And I'm a Baptist preacher, so all these are going to have a P in them, okay? So a shepherd is present, right? What does that mean? That means wherever you are, be there, right? Be present. Be near. Be with people. So a shepherd is present. A shepherd protects. Protects. Listen, you... You have a responsibility as a disciple that's choosing to multiply disciples to to live on mission, to protect, right? What does that mean? Um, I mean, as a dad and and as a father and as a husband, I, I read that word and I think things a little bit differently than maybe you think, right? Because I want to guard my kids' hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want to protect my wife from the wiles of the enemy, what the attacks of the enemy. Well, then I want you to think, man, as a college student, how can you shepherd and protect the people around you? Well, have your eyes 
be switched on, be aware, you know, be, be, be concerned about the journey of your, your fellow classmates, the folks that God's put you in their life. The gospel moves at the speed of relationships. So how are you shepherding those relationships? How are you protecting people? Now listen, you, you gotta, sometimes you gotta get in the face of people, right? I'm just being honest here. You, you know, I don't love confrontation, but when you start to see someone go wayward, a shepherd protects, right? You might have people in your life that you care deeply about, and they're, they are on a path that's not healthy. Man, a shepherd protects. You know, as a, as a dad, you know, you see your kids do certain things, and you're like, God, protect them. Guard their hearts and minds. And you need to kind of begin to see with that lens the heart of a shepherd, a shepherd provides. A shepherd provides. He finds places for those sheep to graze, right? So as, as you begin to live your life on mission, you are, you are providing opportunities for people to go deeper with God. You're beginning to carve out ways for them to, to go deeper and, and feed themselves and, and begin to understand what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And so a a shepherd provides. And then the last thing about a shepherd is that a shepherd knows and cares for his flock. It's all about people. Are you caring for the people in your life? Do you have the heart of a shepherd? The third thing I want to highlight as you think about what does it look like to live on mission, not only the heart of a soldier, I've put my yes on the table, not only the heart of a shepherd, I'm going to begin to see through that lens of a shepherd that I'm going to, I'm going to be present, I'm going to protect, I'm going to care for people, I'm going to provide, uh, you know, opportunities for, for spiritual growth in people's lives, but I am going to possess the heart of a servant. Possess the heart of a servant. Now, what does that look like? Well, there's no greater example than Jesus Christ, Okay. No greater example than King Jesus. So possess the heart of a servant. What does that mean? That means I'm constantly putting others first. You've probably heard I am third. God first, others second, and I'm third. I am, I'm putting other people first in my life. I'm putting other people ahead of my life. And so possessing the heart of a servant is constantly putting the needs of others first. Listen to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. In John chapter 13, literally the last night before Jesus is arrested, or the night Jesus was arrested, the last 24 hours before Jesus uh, goes on trial and is crucified, in the upper room, it's called the upper room discourse, John chapter 13 through 17. The, the disciples and Jesus enter into the upper room, and the scripture says, after uh, a moment, Jesus took off his outer garment, and he put on a, a towel, and the scripture says he washed the disciples' feet. Listen to John chapter 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he had washed their feet and put back on his outer garments, he resumed his place and he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? One passage says, do this, right? So the, the reality is that you and I have to possess the heart of a servant. Man, I love to ask this question, what is the most powerful person in the room do. He serves. I and mean, that's, that's King Jesus, the most powerful person in the room. And what does he do? He does the act of a servant. He does the act of a slave. And, and you don't need a description as to what the roads were like and what their feet were like, because it's nasty enough. But it doesn't matter. Jesus gets down on his knees and he washes their feet. That's the posture of a servant. And so if you, if you want to be used by God, living your life on mission, then when you walk into a room, you don't see yourself as the most important person in the room. 
You see yourself as a servant. One of the things, I can't, I've said this to so many classes, I don't know if I said it in here or not, but the two twin rails of kind of two mantras that we have is the gospel moves at the speed of relationships and live your life in such a way that people ask why. And so if you choose tonight to say, I'm going to live my life on mission, I'm going to have the heart of a soldier, my yes is on the table, I'm going to have the heart of a shepherd, I'm going to care deeply about people and nurture and look after them, I'm going to have the heart or the posture of a servant, I can assure you that a watching world is going to come to you and go, why are you like this? Why do you possess these qualities? And that's your chance to go because Jesus Christ has changed my life. Living your life on mission. Possess the heart of a servant. Man, Jesus, our model. King Jesus, washing the junk off people's feet. Man, wrap your head around that. That's the heart of a servant. The last thing I want you to chew on tonight as we consider what it would look like to live this missional life, is then if those qualities, the heart of a soldier, the heart of a shepherd, and the heart of a servant are real and we're putting them into place, then how do we position ourselves then for his service, right? You're possessing the heart of a soldier. You're possessing the heart of a shepherd. You're possessing the heart of a servant. But are you positioning yourself for his usefulness? Are you positioning yourself for his service. And I would submit to you that these next few things are really, really critical if you're going to be positioning yourself to be useful to the master. And here they are. The first thing is you have to be healthy. You got to be healthy. You have to be whole. Now, here's what I mean by that. You have to be healthy spiritually. Okay, you've got to be healthy spiritually. So what does that mean? That means you've entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've given your heart, your mind, your soul. You've given your all to Jesus. You've said, Jesus, I don't understand all this. I don't understand everything about you, God, but I know I want to give my life over to you. So have you placed your faith and your life in the loving hands of Jesus? That's the first step to spiritual wholeness right? God fills the God-shaped hole in your heart with the Spirit of God, and you become his child. So are you spiritually healthy? Have you entered into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ? If the answer is yes, then you're on your way to spiritual health. So Jesus Christ saves you, and you enter into this covenant relationship with God, and for the rest of your life, you can walk with him and know him and experience him and have the most incredible journey with him. But there's a few other things to spiritual health. The first one is, you and I have to treasure this this book. You have to treasure the word of God. You need to saturate your soul daily in this book. Find a way to do it. Man, as a youth pastor, this was the hardest thing. Man, how can you get students to love God's word? It's just so hard. It's hard to understand. I don't get it. I don't have time for this. I'm really, really busy. I'm telling you, if you're not healthy spiritually, it's because you might not be treasuring God's word, saturating your soul in God's word. That's the first thing to spiritual health. The second Thing is to practice what Jesus, uh, what, the, what the scripture says, Paul says, praying without ceasing. So prayer becomes the foundation of your life. I love God's word. I treasure God's word. And listen, there are so many deliverables. Man, I get like six emails every day from a ministry called Heartlight. And so wherever I am, if I'm on a plane or on a train or just walking on the beach or wherever, man, I love the beach. How many of y'all love the beach? Okay, cool. I can't see you, but I'm I'm sure some hands went up. Man, wherever you are, you can open up your phone and, and be in devotion right there. That's treasuring God's word. Find moments in your life where you can open up God's word, treasure God's word, pray without ceasing. Prayer becomes the foundation of your life. Pray about everything. 
Pray about everything. You know, food, sure, pray about your food. But everything, man, trust God, cry out to God, and pray without ceasing. The third thing to spiritual health is practicing the presence of God. There was a guy by the name of Brother Andrew. I think it was 17th century. Brother Andrew, you know who Brother Andrew was? He was a monk. And you know what his job was? He was a dishwasher and a cook. And I'm talking about him in the 21st century, right? Is that crazy? Brother Andrew wrote a journal, kept his journal, and it's, it's called Practicing the Presence of God. Just being aware of God's presence in every part of your day. It's being on this moment-by-moment conversation with God. Spiritual health, the word, prayer, his presence. And then the last part of spiritual health is listening and responding to the Holy Spirit. Remember I said earlier, healthy things bear fruit. Healthy things produce something. And so as you and I are saturating our souls in God's word, we're foundationally crying out to God and practicing his presence in prayer, then as the Holy Spirit prompts you, as God begins to press into you and say, man, I think you should do this. I think you should invite that person. I think you should do this. I think maybe you should go be a journeyman or go to Myrtle Beach. My friends at Myrtle Beach will love that. Um, but whatever God's saying, be a part of the 10 project. What do you do? You respond in obedience to the Lord. That's what healthy things do. They produce fruit. So man, you have to have spiritual health if you're going to position yourself to be used by God. Listen, God is going to reach for his people to use. He's going to reach for his instrument to use, right? Now, when you're in your kitchen, I've been in some of your dorm rooms, not on this campus, but some dorm rooms, and I wouldn't touch the spoon or bowl in that sink to save my life, okay? Because it's just nasty, right? You know what I'm talking about, those of you, or that pile of laundry that's been like, the cesspool in the corner. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine what's going on in some of your dorm rooms right now. But, but here's the deal. You're not going to reach for that shirt that's been stanking in the corner. You're just not going to do it. You're not going to reach for that, that cup or that knife to use as an instrument. You're just not going to do it because it's not, it's not clean. And God's going to reach for his instruments that are healthy right? He's going to reach for those that are healthy. So you need to be healthy spiritually. Now I'm going to meddle here for just a second as if I haven't already. But um, one of the things that um, God really convicted me of is in 2008, I was in London. I was coming home on a mission trip and I weighed 243 pounds. All right. Now I'm a svelte 199. I might be 203 after cafeteria food for a few days. But anyway, Bless you. Um, And so, uh, but I weighed 243 pounds and I was just coming home from a mission trip. We were in London and we were hanging out and God spoke to me like, I mean, he hit me with a ball peen hammer in the forehead, right? I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it's very painful. And he said, Mike, what if I want to do something with your life and you're not physically able to do it? (laughs) Yeah, he said that to me, okay? And I weighed 243 pounds. And listen, I've always been athletic. And I, you know, I just didn't think it was that bad. But I jumped out of an airplane once, 14,500 feet. And uh, I looked like a Sharpe. I don't know if you know what that looks like. But that's what I looked like coming down on a plane in a parachute, right? The video is hilarious. I, I, it's terrible. Anyway, so, um, but the reality is I, I got home to Houston dead August. I got on an AstroTurf football stadium pitch, and I started running back and forth 120 yards, right? The 100 yards of of the actual field and 10 and 10, whatever, that's 120. Yeah, that's right. And so I ran 120 yards back and forth for 20 minutes. And then I did that the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. No joke. I lost 20 pounds. And then I could run on the concrete. 
And so I, because who wants to run on 150 degree AstroTurf in August, right? So you run on 110 degree asphalt in Houston. So anyway, and so what happened was I made a commitment that I was going to lose 40 pounds. Now listen, I don't care what I look like, but I want you to know my heart, my heart is, my heart's good. Like my resting heart rate's 48. That's pretty good for an old man, okay? And, and so, but here's the deal. The reason I told you that story is, I want to, I don't, I don't want to be taken out. I want to go until I breathe my last. I don't care what I look like. This is not about a fashion statement or, or whatever about me. This is about what if God wants to use your life for something and you're not physically prepared to do it. Now, some of you might have physical ailments. You might have real physical illnesses. And so, you know, don't let this land on you. But to be honest, some of us in the room, this is a, I, I have this constant reminder every day of that moment. That's why I work out every day because I want to go. Now, I could get hit by a bus or that car this morning that, and, could, you know, I could be off at that moment, but I'm good with that, right? I am because I know that I've been paying the price physically and it's never too late to take a step toward fitness, right? And those of you in college, you're like, man, some of you flat bellies, you really frustrate me, okay? Like some of you guys, you can eat whatever you want and do whatever you want. I've never been that. I've been more like a bowling ball with ears my whole life, okay? And so, but the reality is, man, listen, you've got one life to live. And you ought, to be, you ought to be paying the price physically so you could do all you can to make much of him for as long as you can for the glory of God, right? Rant over. All right. Physically be healthy. The third thing about health is you need to be emotionally healthy. Now listen, this has been the hardest 18 months I've ever experienced. Can't imagine if I was, um, if I was your age what I would be thinking. It's, this has been the hardest season. Can I just tell you, it is not a sin to be struggling emotionally. But don't walk this road alone. Please, if you're struggling, if you're not healthy emotionally and you know it right now, please, I will stay here till they kick me out of this room tonight to sit down and have conversations with you. Listen, find someone that you know cares about you and tell them, I am not doing well. My mental health, my emotional health is not what it should be, and I need help. That is not a sin, and shame on us in the church for cloaking it in that. It is not that. But I'm telling you, it's hard to be used by God, right, if you're struggling in the depths of despair. You, it's, almost, it's, it's almost like it's hard for you to even breathe, right? much less take, take on great hard things for the glory of God. Find someone that you trust tonight and speak to them about what's going on deep in your soul, what's going on in your mind, and get, get, in, get in some conversations with people that will walk with you, okay? Man, we, we all, we're all desperate for you to be used by God for the glory of God, but we want you to be healthy. Okay, so spiritual health, physical health, and emotional health. And, and part of all of that is creating a rhythm in your life, okay? And we're all different. Some of us are wired at, you know, our hair's on fire. You know, just go as hard as you want. And, and, and honestly, I'm a bit like that. I'd rather work out and, 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 and preach 100 times in a week than do five Teams calls. You know what I'm saying? I would just, I'm sick of Zoom and Teams, right? But the, the reality is not everybody's wired like that. Some, some folks need a little more calm, a little more steady, right? But figure out what your rhythms are and walk in health. It's critical for the kingdom of God. It's critical for you, right? So have, a, have an understanding of your spiritual health. The second thing about positioning yourself for the glory of God not only health, but a sense of urgency, right? What flips your switch tonight? Seriously, what drives you? 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians, for the love of Christ compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. And so when, when I talk about urgency, there, there needs to be recognized tonight that there's a lostness of humanity. I was in a couple of classes today talking about post-Christian culture. And the reality is there's this, there's this numbness to truth. And the lostness of humanity is palpable. You can see it and feel it all around us. So what should that do to you and me? It should create a sense of urgency for the gospel. And I want to be an instrument that God reaches for. I want to position myself because I'm not numb to the lostness of the world around me. So balance that with health and your own emotional health. But listen, as you walk in health and wholeness, then let God well up within you a sense of urgency for a lost world around you. Urgency. It's a word that we don't preach about much anymore. I mean, we used to, man, we used to have some fire-breathing, hell-stomping preachers talking about the lostness of our world. Our world is just as lost. We've just quit talking about it. Urgency. Let's be the people that God reaches for and have this heartbeat for the nations that were driven with this sense of urgency. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this next one because I landed on it pretty hard last night. But faith, what are you dreaming for the kingdom of God for tonight? What are you believing God for that is of him, that's unexplainable? I can't tell you how many nights in England I laid my head on my pillow, exhausted, knowing and saying out loud, I can't do this day tomorrow without you, God a sense of desperation and just knowing that God's calling you into something that there's no way you can do it alone and you need him. That is faith. That is living your life, positioning yourself in a life of faith. We talked about dependency last night, didn't we? But that's what it does for, me, for you and me. And it's almost like the circle of wholeness is, is complete as we exercise the muscles of our faith and God begins to, to deepen us. And then not only that, but then we begin to depend on him more. And it's this really cool rhythm of what it looks like to be used by God. The last thing about positioning yourself to be used by God is availability. Availability. I started out with the heart of a soldier and is your yes on the table. And I think probably most of you in the room would probably say, my yes is on the table. I would venture that, that you're here in this room tonight, a couple of days into this conference, this experience, and you've already decided I'm going to follow Jesus. Well, I want you to think and dream about how, how God could use your availability, right? How could God use you? God, I'm available to you, right? Semesters, summers, when you graduate, man, would you give your life in complete abandonment and availability to God? Um, fellas, I want to speak to you for one minute, and then we're going to be done. I referenced this briefly last night. I want you to know, gentlemen, that I understand the pressure that a lot of you face um, to earn a significant wage when you graduate from college. And you know, you, you carry a weight um, from your dads, okay? I carried that weight. I can remember when I surrendered to ministry, my father, who was not a follower of Christ, said, well, you'll never be rich. Didn't get it, didn't understand. And the pressure to, to um, you know, succeed in our culture is really, really high. But I'm just telling you right now, gentlemen, there's nothing in this world that will fulfill your heart, will meet your expectations like following and serving and being available to King Jesus. Nothing. And don't let the pressures of this world keep you from 
leaving your zip code and going to another zip code for the gospel. Gentlemen, every org would tell you that we're desperate for men. Ladies, y'all are amazing. No pressure. But y'all are amazing because, I mean, we have so many young ladies, young singles, women giving their life away on the mission field. It's incredible what God's doing through our ladies. And gentlemen, I'm not trying to jam you up. I just want you to know, I know the pressure that you're under. But he's worth it. And your availability to the kingdom of God is really, really important. Okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we, um, we want to spend the rest of our days making disciples who make disciples. That was your last words to us. So God, help us, help us, Lord, to live our life fulfilling that mandate, that commandment, that call, those words from your mouth to make disciples. God, we want to live on mission with that in mind for the rest of our lives. And so, Lord, help us to position ourselves to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. 